Hello. Well, thank you for being here. So as you all know, Patrick Rock is going to be my sabbatical replacement in the fall. And I've known Rock for over 15 years. We met in San Francisco. We had both finished grad school. He went to the San Francisco Art Institute. I went to CCA. We were both doing performance in different ways, thinking about the body. Um, and over the years, Rock and I have been through a lot together. We have. He's helped me on projects. My son peed on his chest in the te Texas desert. I mean, what, what hasn't happened here? <laughs> um, so in any case, I'm just, I feel really, really lucky um, to have Rock be able to be a part of Cranbrook for a short time and to be able to um, share the experience with the students. And um, I'm confident it's going to be an amazing ride in the fall with Rock. And um, I wanted to read, instead of giving you a really formal list of Rock's achievements, I don't think I could do it any better than the bio he wrote, so I'm just going to read it. Um, Patrick Rock is a post-conceptual artist and the founder and director of Rock's Box Contemporary Fine Art in Portland, Oregon. Rock's Box is an artist-run short-term artist residency and exhibition site with a mandate to support artists producing contemporary conceptual and performance-influenced work. Rock is the director and co-founder of the free summer school, COPS, Conceptual Organ Performance School, a free performance and critique-based summer program at Rock's Box Contemporary Fine Art, and a co-founder of Rock's Books, Leipzig, Portland, an artist and designer-ran publishing house for artist catalogs. Rock is also a co-creator of A Portland Conversation and Culture, a printed guide to contemporary art venues in Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, BC. Patrick is the past director of the PC the PSU School of Art and Design Exhibition Galleries at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon, where he is, he is visiting art faculty in the MFA studio and undergraduate programs. Rock's work is autobiographical in origin and examines the pathos of contemporary cultural constructs and idealized intellectual pursuit through the act of slapstick. He has exhibited his performance installation, sculpture, and video work internationally, most recently with, with California Split at the Pitt LA, with accompanying artist book, California Split, carried by Print and Matter, New York City. I know, I know, I know. At 1430 Contemporary, Pig Dog Monkey Manifestos, at Airspace London, England, and the Forced Air Inflated Viewer Interactive Jump Room Sculpture, Oscars Delirium Tremens, at Pika's TBA Festival. As well as performing with the mobile rolling free restaurant, American Meat LLC, and the post-post-post-punk band, Piss, at the Sequence Performance Art Festival in Reykjavik, Island, Iceland. Patrick Rock is alumnus in the New Genre Studio 10 program at the San Francisco Art Institute. Patrick Rock. <laughs> thank you, Liz. Um, I better say thank you to everybody now, or if I say it at the end, I'll cry. Uh, this, is, this has been a, a blast of a week. Um, you guys have something really special here. Uh, I think you probably know that, but you've all been very kind and generous, and uh, I've had a great time, and I really, really look forward to returning in the fall. So, um, That kind of just says what Liz said. Uh, meditations. I would like to begin my talk with asking all of you to please meditate with me. Breathe, relax, and meditate on these seven images and influential to the, develop my, to the development, to my development as an artist. A little meditational music. Go! 
Bus for Andrea Zatel leaves in five minutes. All right. Um, place and space. Uh, this is where I uh, first lived after I left home at 17. Uh, you've probably seen this image in free calendars that you get at the gas station, uh, or maybe in the movie Goonies, or in Point Break. Um, if you uh, want to ask me a cat question about Catherine Bigelow later, I've got a great story about an interaction with Catherine Bigelow during the filming of Point Break. Um, this is what I did when I lived on the Oregon coast. Whoops. Actually, that's Julian Schnabel. <laughs> that's what's called like a lazy drop-in. It's what you do when you're kind of like fat. And um, that's kind of how I surf too, though. But uh, anyway. Uh, this was my first studio in Astoria, Oregon, on the Columbia River. So I, uh, I lived in that build. I had a, a, a small shack in Cannon Beach where I showed you, and then I lived in this building for five years making work, and none of that work survives today. Uh, you should be very fortunate about that. Um, this, is, um, this is the land of Robert Adams. Robert Adams and his wife would bring me sugar cookies to my studio but this is the, the jetty in Astoria. So I just thought he was like a really cool guy uh, and a really co cool lady that uh, brought me cookies and then I learned there Robert it was Robert Adams and his wife. When not there, I hung out here. This was in Portland, Oregon called Satyricon. It was a punk club. I don't know if the punk's the right word for it, but it was a punk club. Uh, that little window is where you got really good Sivlaki at late at night. Um, this was my introduction to punk rock. Uh, this is pre-internet, so the people weren't pretty although they are beautiful. Uh, this is a band called Smegma, a noise band that uh, is friends with um, Destroy All Monsters. Uh, school, gotta go to school, right? Uh, this is the San Francisco Garden Institute. It's kind of like Cranbrook West, right? Fillmore East, Fillmore West, um, except it's Spanish colonial. Uh, this is Studio 10. Uh, it's kind of like the, well, it's a condemned building now, but um, this is where I learned about community, creativity, critique, conceptual concerns, critical theory, and cocaine. Um, don't do cocaine. The others are okay. Uh, uh, I made performance art, had delusions of grandeur, and presidential aspirations. Uh, m this is my first sarcophagus. It was a sculptural object in direct relation to my physical body and psychological state, as well as my love of the uncanny. Oh, those are white carnations on, on styrofoam. So, it, you know, it decayed and uh, I threw it away. <laughs> uh, here's a video.
that's kind of my nod to Freudian repetition compulsion. Um, I like to call it a kind of my homage to Bronchusi, the Stooges, Buster Keaton, Samuel Beckett, EPS Styrofoam, Olympia Beer. We used to call them rat turds and the Rock Family Reunion in, in where my brothers would destroy every chair at the family reunion, uh, not on purpose. Uh, there's the disclaimer. So I view everything I do in my practice as, as a piece. Um, while the lines are blurred, I don't blur the lines or see them as being blurred. Uh, this is my logo. It's a big sausage laying down on its side. Uh, this is a building. Um, I purchased this building with my older sisters. Um, I promised them fame and fortune. Nine years later, uh, they've forgiven me. Um, it's 1,200 square feet of living quarters, artist residency and studio upstairs, and exhibition and project space downstairs with classrooms in every room during COPS, a fire pit in the back, and dogs everywhere. It's also on uh, public transportation, the light rail line, so you can go to and from the airport to Roxbox. So I've had over 50 exhibitions here. Oh, that's the next slide. <laughs> uh, Roxbox. I opened it in 2007 on July 4th, and that's kind of what Liz said. I have a mandate to support performance and conceptual influenced work. It functions as a short-term artist residency. It's always free. Um, free isn't free. We know that, right? Uh, 50 plus exhibitions and lectures on site and off in the site of COPS Conceptual Organ Performance School. Uh, this was one of my first exhibitions. This is a performance artist, Jennifer Locke. I guess that this is the point where I say that the people sitting next to you right now are your colleagues now and in the future. And whether you truly like them or not, you probably do love them. And down the road, they're going to be the people that you show with and call on and that, and that help you out. So Jennifer... Um, uh, Jennifer's a performance artist. Jennifer's a professor of new genres at San Francisco Art Institute. Um, and I don't think she minds me saying these personal things about her because it's so much in the work. Jennifer's a professional dominatrix, a jiu-jitsu fighter, um, a submission wrestler. Um, something else, what did I have down here? Oh, her work addresses the female body, endurance, the gaze, and the interaction of participation of the viewer when experiencing an action in real and in mediated time. So this is Jennifer in the space, staring into a video camera, which is being projected into projectors throughout the space. At a certain point, she peeled off this cat suit. Um, is that what it's called? <laughs> and you can see it's projected throughout the space. So the viewer has the option of whether, you know, watching Jennifer or watching the video, and she's interested in that space and what that implies in the viewer. I switched into this workout gear. Um, and proceeded to jump rope for 40 minutes, leaving marks on the floor with the leather. It's deceptive that there was a, actually a big crowd there, but people tend not to get real close to Jennifer when she's performing. Once again, mediated through the video inside of the space. Uh, she then proceeded to go to this mirror and, and shave a bald spot on the top of her head, I think representative of a midlife crisis. And then do this piece that's called uh, Interrupted Loop, where she draws blood from the right arm and injects it back into her left arm. Uh, we then had a, a, I'd hired a male, she'd asked me to hire a male stripper. So she, she continued to go from start at the front of the space and work her way out the back of the space towards the fire pit. Um, and the male stripper gave her a lap dance while that, that beatbox in the, in the uh, corner there, um, there it is on the video, that beatbox is playing Gigi Allen's Master Daddy, at which point she, the, male, the strip show was done, and she put on a pair of uh, big black steel-toed boots and kicked the crap out of this CD player. Um, I made her retentive, so I then swept it up and put it in the corner where it stayed for the remainder of the exhibition. Uh, this is Keith Bodwe. Uh, Keith Bodwe is also a professor of new genres at San Francisco Art Institute and California College of Art. Uh, California College of Art. Uh, Keith is known for his performance and video work. You may have heard, there's always like those myths that, that surround an artist, right? And that they try to outlive. 
and Keith was known in the 80s, uh, late 80s in Los Angeles for shooting uh, paint, egg temper paint out of his ass and making paintings. What people think, I think people missed is that the paintings were like really gorgeous and he became known for that act and um, he's finally, you know, outliving it, it, outliving it now, but he's not as arrogant as he looks. Is he Liz? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, this was a, the poster for the exhibition. I didn't think anything of it when he sent it to me. I was like, oh, what a great, what a great piece. Like, you, you know, you're, you're a fountain. Um, the printer called me up and said, we don't ever want your business again. <laughs> and at the time I was mailing things out, it's like the internet was around and I had an email list and all that. And I was sending this, this out folded. And um, I had this friend at the time living in Portland who was this French and he, he, he his French was like r really, good and his English was really bad and we'd hang out a lot and have trouble understanding each other because I mumble and he speaks French. Um, but he would, he'd get invited to art dinners and after this I kind of didn't get invited to some art dinners. But uh, he came back and like, oh Patrick, I heard about you at dinner tonight. I said, oh yeah, what, what, what's, what's up? He's like, they say you're a rich kid from Los Angeles who shows people pissing in their mouth. And I was like, well they, they, got, they got half of that right. Um, anyway, he also told me, but I've seen you eat food off the floor. Um, here's the actual photo. This piece is called California by Keith. His marriage, marriage to his husband, Kenny, who's his better half, <laughs> um, became, you know, it was legal and then it was illegal and then they were the first gay couple to get married in California in Alameda County. It's a great video if you look it up online. Um, yeah. So I, I remain loyal to the people that show in my, in my space. This was a show called No Painting Left Behind. It was about the time uh, one of the wars we were in, or in. Um, and also the idea of No Child Left Behind. All the artists create the posters for the exhibitions. I'm a real fan of bad design, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, this was one of the paintings from the exhibition. They're, they're not much smaller than this. They're about eight feet high. I uh, know, about seven. Uh, this is called Psychoanalysis. This is called In My Room. Uh, this is called Smoking Clam. Sometimes you get a review. Uh, this was uh, the, th the third uh, show I did with Keith called, uh, uh, what is it called? It's called um, Nobody Loves You When You're Old and Gay. Is that right? So that's me standing behind the, the back of one of their paintings. So that idea of like running a space and being behind the scenes but being part of the, the whole thing all the time in the front of the poster. Uh, here, here's a video. Each exhibition gets a, a video walk through either, either uh, pre or post um, exhibition and I put them up on the internet. So they're shot real low quality with my phone. The, d the idea being that they only exist on the internet as a teaser for people to come.
Of this painting. Uh, this is called Critical Theory. Keith likes to mess with me and Justin Lieberman. Like, you guys are into that egghead stuff when the truth is, Keith really is. He kind of embodies it and lives it. Um, and you kind of have to be on the inside to critique something, don't you? Really? Liz said I only have 60 minutes, so I'm going to hustle, <laughs> hustle up a bit. Uh, this is Ruben Lorch Miller. So, uh, I want everybody to have an unexpected experience every time they come to an exhibition at Rocks Box. I don't want them to see the same thing twice. I want them to walk in and be like, whoa, what happened the last time? You know, and, and what, is, what is this this time? So these were hand-built, unfired ceramics that we showed that he made at Rocks Box while in residence. And then we f he came back after the exhibition was done and we fired him and almost burnt down my house um, with, a, with a wood fire in the backyard. He'd just been to, to Vienna, and they were, uh, I think he was influenced by the, by the architecture he saw there of, of um, the communist era, of the communist rule. So the gallery can go from, you know, the transgressive and, and um, the scatological to, to something real formal like this. Uh, this is an exhibition I did, I guess, two years ago now. Uh, at the time, there was like that proliferation of, of, of regional biennials, and I was like, why does anybody care about a regional biennial? Um, so I did this exhibition called the International International Triennial of Contemporary Wind Chimes. So I invited uh, 62 artists to submit wind chimes, and the only stipulation was that, uh, it, you know, I got a lot of emails saying, why should I be in this, and what do you want? And I would say, well, it only has to do what a wind chime does. And my idea behind that was that the viewing of a wind chime kind of uh, reflects the current psychological condition of the viewer, right? You either love them or you hate them. So um, here's a video walkthrough.
Oh, that's Freud's surgery. Uh, this room upstairs was called uh, pretentious. Uh, so I strung 6,000 feet of paracord throughout the space. Um, I was thinking a lot about Duchamp's piece and what was it, 6,000 feet of thread? Is that what it's, 6,000 feet of string they did at Peggy, Peggy Guggenheim's Upper West Side apartment? So I strung 6,000 feet of, of randomly of paracord through the space and then hung these wind chimes in it with the idea that they really wouldn't function as wind chimes at all, but as, but as objects. This, uh, this room was called, um, what was it called? Pretentious Asshole Conceptual Types. Kind of one of my favorite pieces from the show. This was by Fiona Connors of Los Angeles. Uh, it was called Poem to Sleep. So when the window was open, the pieces would blow across the room. Uh, this was a piece by Arnold Kemp. Um, it was called Two Coconut Wind Chimes Hexed by a Black Witch. There was a specific set of instructions on how to open and repackage these and send them back to him. And I followed them. Uh, this hallway was called Show Me the Money because everybody sent in their work late. Uh, this is a piece by Brian Cannon of Second Cannons Press in Los Angeles where he just put a, sent me these art magazines and a stack of change like kind of waiting for the wind or somebody to jar them and the change to make, make the time sound. Uh, this room is called Sausage Fest. Obviously, all the, you know, all the phalluses. Uh, this room was called, No, It's Cool, You Can Trust Me, I'm a Feminist. So there actually were feminists in there and then a bunch of people in the community that kind of think they're feminist or act like feminists, dudes. Uh, this was a video by Jennifer Locke called Bottle Chime. Uh, she's sober, as you, and she set up all these whiskey bottles and blew them over with a leaf blower in this beautiful five-minute loop. Uh, this back room is called Dirty Smelly Hippie Types. Uh, part of what I do are, are propagandas and posters that are always free at the space. You know, you say it about Detroit sometimes. The artists also are, fr are free to make these. So it's never the same thing twice. I uh, don't want to label it with that kind of branding. It's specific to the exhibition. I realize in this format that uh, if you're a landscape, you get a lot better view than a portrait. Uh, propaganda is t-shirts and stickers. So I try to sell these for 30 bucks and then I end up giving them away. I see them on people I don't know, so I wonder if they don't go to like the thrift store and then get picked up for. I offered to make people these, these, these uh, jackets with, in biker culture, these are called cuts. And I actually got a phone call from my friend who was a biker and said, don't wear that. And I said, why? He said, well, if you're lucky, they'll just take it away from you. Um, but no one, of course, no one ordered one. I knew, I knew they wouldn't. But as far as I knew, there was no bikers that had black and pink as their colors. Not yet, anyway. Uh, I'm really into yellow legal pads and, and note taking. So this is a series, an edition of 12 blankets I made that I ended up, fleece blankets that I ended up giving away. Uh, then stickers. That's the logo of the Portland Art Museum, and I just kind of turned it into an R by putting a crutch underneath it. Kind of a corporate logo. Kind of an ode, uh, uh, an ode to teaching sometimes. This is my favorite one. These went so fast, I never even got to keep one. I love the, cop the cocktail napkin. This is an idea of note taking or a place for ideas. These are all these stickers are four by four, screen printed. Uh, sometimes you come and there's a there's a punk band playing. Uh, this this was a band I was in called Piss. Uh, I always thought I looked like Alan Vega, but I probably look like more like El Duce. Uh, this is the punch bowl at the openings. 
So I like to go to bed before the openings is o- are over and listen to the conversation outside and smell the smoke from the fire. In the morning, I like to wake up and see where the punch bowl ended up as people try to drain the last of it out. Uh, this was a bar I opened called Rock's Bar that lasted one evening. Um, critics were berated and artists fell downstairs, so I, I shut that down. Uh, sometimes you can come and get a free tattoo. There's a local tattoo artist that comes sometimes and gives tattoos. This is David Dunlap. David Dunlap went to Yale, teaches at, at, uh, at Iowa. Um, he's like 75 years old, and, and he got a free tattoo. Um, these are former students from PSU and PNCA. They're, they're members of uh, the Klamath and the Nez Pierce tribe, and they did a festival last year called One Flaming Arrow and asked me if they could paint a mural on the front of my building, and I was like, yeah, of course. So, oh, these are my dogs. That's Babs and Iggy. I got you back, right? Uh, Cracker, Butters. He'll probably be coming with me next next fall. And this is what it's like to be an artist in residence at Rocks Box. I just want to prove I did it. Um, these are my MFA students to Portland State on a trip that we took to LA a month ago to do studio visits. Uh, I sent this to my boss and said, fat guy on the quilted t-shirt wants more money. Uh, this is COPS, Conceptual Oregon Performance School. And there's nothing I can say about it that this, this, this video I made for this, these series of slides I made were for the Warhol Foundation who'd funded me and wanted to know why they'd given me the money last December. Um, so I'm just gonna, you're not gonna see any documentation of the performances because people come there and do performances, some of them doing them for the first time, some of them working out ideas, and I do document it and I do keep it, but I don't show it out of respect to them because they're working on their practice or their craft. So I made this, this slideshow instead. There are some videos out there you can watch, but mostly I, I keep it. I really actually love the institution. I kind of never left since I went to the Ernst I mean. You got you, you to gotta love it to critique it, right? The pyramid scheme. Lucy's a part up there. Freud. Money. This kind of goes out on the posters. This is, these, are, these numbers are, have gone up. I write more clearly than I speak sometimes. <laughs> Google Maps of the front of Rocks Box during Cops. I love bad graffiti too. So I crossed out each date as they happened. Open enrollment, anybody walks in, anybody walks out. Marathon critiques, sometimes they go to two, three in the morning. Anyone who brings work gets their work talked about, and uh, people can come and go as they want, but n- we don't leave, or the, the visiting artists slash instructors, they don't leave till the, all the work's been, been seen and talked about, so they, they go late. Kind of what a critique there looks like. Uh, each visiting artist gives an artist talk, free. Uh, last summer I had Math Bath, I'm sorry, two summers ago, I had Math Bass and Eve Fowler from Los Angeles come. Eve Fowler runs artist curated projects in, in Los Angeles. It starts out with like 150 people show up on Friday night, and then Saturday night, like 50 people show up, and then by Sunday, when it's time for class to start, about eight people show up, which I've kind of grown used to, but the demands of a free school are a lot more. People come up to you and like, you're out of toilet paper. You're out of firewood. <laughs> Just go back to class. This is just a still shot of even math making their students get naked in the woods. They actually read uh, many, many, many men. I'm sorry. Yep. No, many, many women. Many, many women is read by many, many men. And this is kind of the lineup for this year. This will be this July.
I also like the posters to be unclear. Does that make sense? I like the idea of someone who comes is, is taking a risk um, and seeing something or experience something they, they, they didn't see before. So these, these are this year's visiting professors. They're instructors, there'll be more. I received funding from the Precipice Fund, which is a regranting organization. Uh, it's a, an arm of PICA, the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art, and uh, they're regranters for the Warhol Foundation. I think you have something similar to it in Detroit. And the Caligram Foundation is Ali Ferlati, who, who matches all the funds from the, the Warhol Foundation. So I do receive funding for this. All the funding goes towards paying for the artists to fly out and, and to stay in a motel, cause, unless they like dogs. Um, and, and, and running, you know, the clerical uh, and material end of the institution. This year, I'm actually going to start addressing the object, so there will be making, you know. I've noticed, uh, yeah. Uh, this kind of, I like to think this sums up my, my actual, my object-making practice. This is Buster Keaton from the 1924 film Cops. So... Um, I'm a big fan of slapstick and old silent films and Buster Keaton's deadpan and what he does with objects. Anyone seen this film? YouTube, five minutes, it's, no, it's a great investment. Uh, this is a scene where he's riding on a trailer full of a cop's furniture uh, that he's try trying to deliver. He doesn't know what he's doing with it. <laughs> and the anarchist bomb la 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 uh, drops in his lap off a building. So he lights his cigarette with it and then throws it into the parade. Um, this is a piece called Cool. So I was in uh, a Safeway one night and I saw the beer cooler sitting on top of the beer cooler, whatever you call it, refrigerator. Uh, and it was kind of glowing under those fluorescent lights. And plus, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd made that video, video Iggy Wanna Fuck. Um, and I was like, these are brand koozies, these are gorgeous. And plus I'd made the previous sarcophagus. Um, so I, I bought a bunch of them and I uh, went to a, a shop in San Francisco and had them 3D scan it and then I then had it enlarge it to what m the size of my sarcophagus would be. I then had it carved out of EPS styrofoam. So there's this, this aesthetic in my work, what did I call it? I call it that, uh, the integrity of materials that it is, which it is. So if I'm going to make a piece about beer coolers, it's got to be made out of the same materials. Although this was a solid piece. So kind of that idea of the monumental being very cheap and the fact that, you know, EPS styrofoam is kind of forever. It is archival. A bunch of German skateboarders came in and tried to open this up. The opening was pretty, that was pretty funny. It was just a solid piece. Uh, also, you know, people touch it and it gets, it gets filthy and dirty, so these traces of, of the viewer who can't help but touch it. Very light. It had to stay in Germany, so I don't, I don't know where it is. Uh, this is a piece called Never Give an Inch. Uh, it was based upon the Ken Kesey novel, Sometimes a Great Notion, which is a novel about uh, patriarch, colonialism, racism, sexism, incest, generational gaps, hippies, work, labor, small town politics, and the destructive and unrelenting sublime forces of nature in place. Plus, you know, sometimes you just want to flip people off at openings. So I stuck the spar, th anyone read the novel? So I stuck the spar through the, through the wall. It's the patriarch's arm at the beginning of the book swaying from a, from a logging choker. Edgar Winter. He's actually my neighbor, he's an art critic, but he looks like Edgar Winter. I can't help but hear Frankenstein in my head whenever I'm talking to him. Uh, this is Face It, Your Hippies. Um, this was kind of an, an homage to Alan Capra's Happenings, the Grateful Dead, Sunshine and Daydream 1972 free concert, best dark star ever, at the Springfield Creamery in Veneta, Oregon, and the dark side of the trip gone bad, i.e. making art. Uh, this was at Ditch Projects in Springfield, Oregon. I show at Artist Run Spaces, uh, I find that you hear a lot less no's there. Money doesn't become as much of a factor. Uh, it's, a, it's a good time. This is Ditch Projects. It was over a mill run. 
So this is Springfield, Oregon. Springfield, Oregon is, is situated in between Eugene, Oregon and Springfield, Oregon and the Cascade foothills. So you've got a, a college hippie town, which is now a sports town uh, with the influence of Nike money. And then you've kind of got this logging, uh, trucking town, and then you've got the foothills. Uh, this piece was called Black Flags. And I stretched a piano wire from ditch to that other sawtooth building in the back. The history, uh, I've found it interesting as place. I lived under this building for a week during the installation, so I built the platform over the creek. And it was summertime, and I spent my week reading the entire um, catalog of Ken Kesey novels. And every morning I'd wake up, there'd be deer and, and, and birds and bunny, bunny rabbits. But the building in the back in World War II, the, the logs rolled in, the, the lumber rolled in the back of the warehouse that sawtooth building you see, and they made PT boats, and they went out the other end on a, on a train, and apparently uh, John F. Kennedy was on one of them. But I like this idea, you know, of what happens when, when, when subcultures and countercultures exist alongside, exist alongside of these things. So these are all triple extra large t-shirts that I black tie-dyed while I was there and stretched them on piano wire. So they, they kind of, the wire sung as the wind blew through it. Um, you had to buy the whole piece. You couldn't just buy a t-shirt and nobody wants a triple extra large t-shirt. Uh, this piece was called Do It Your Artist. So this was a fountain full of um, grape drink in Everclear with uh, compost from the forest and the mills surrounding it. This is the inside of the building. It was the old, uh, the old wheelhouse for the mill back when it ran on water. So this is some video of, of, of me underneath the building being projected into the walls of the gallery and the fountain running. So I lived underneath this building for a week um, and interacted with this inflatable family. Uh, I bisected the gallery at a 45 degree angle because it sits on the 45th parallel between the North Pole and the equator. Painted one half the gallery white and one half the gallery black. Those pieces on the wall on the left are called bad. Uh, they're pages of LSD. Uh, a page of LSD is 1,000 hits of LSD. So I bought blotter paper and then wrote bad 1,000 times on each sheet, and then I gave it to this old hippie named Aztec and asked him to, to dose him um, and then give him back to me. And I, I, I really don't know whether he actually did or not, but then I, I handled him with gloves and framed him up. Um, then on the other sect of the bisected gallery was a setup for the band. So I'm living underneath the gallery for a week and have the band set up and the soundtrack that played for a week that drove the guys at the gallery crazy was was the soundtrack from Sunshine and Daydream, the Grateful Dead's 1972 uh, concert. Um, and at 10 o'clock at night, I came out from underneath the building and our, our band performed a set of Grateful Dead songs and then our, uh, a, a set of Piss songs to kind of close the evening out. This was the room where I tie-dyed the shirts. The projection on the wall is, 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 the, is the entire library of Ken Kesey, of his novels. Performing with my family, subjecting them to the traumas of a bad trip, and beer bonging from a skull. It was hot out.
I never like people who sit outside of openings, so the way to get them back inside. Uh, that song was called Empathy. I know you heard that. Um, this is a piece I did called Simulacra Hermaphrodite. Uh, it's a force air inflated viewer and octave sculpture. I like the idea of a monumental sculpture being temporary, in this case a phallus, which can be become erect and engorged, funhouse, and then flip of a switch deflated, flaccid, rolled up and stuffed into a basement. So this is a CAD drawing. I drew the original sketches, then made up a CAD drawing, and then sent this off to a fabricator. Uh, that's when the real f fun begins. Um, so you enter through that, well, you know, there. <laughs> there's no easy way to enter, and there's no easy way to exit. So you, you really can't maintain your dignity inside, uh, especially when you come out. This wasn't meant to point that out. It was actually, I was so amazed that her jacket matched the piece. It's kind of a sublime experience inside of color, color and sound, and you know, jumping, almost weightlessness. This was my next inflatable called Oscar's Delirium Tremens. Uh, it was for the Time-Based Arts Festival in, in, in Portland, Oregon. Um, you know, it was kind of an homage to Oscar Wilde, The Hangover. Um, it's a self-portrait, a you know, a, a prostrated and prone pink elephant laying on his back. Uh, at the time, I had a black round bed that I was I was pretty proud of. Where kind of all my art dreams came from. Started with a sketch, improved upon that sketch, or you know, a different, a better, whatever, better sketch. Goes to a CAD drawing, and then goes to the fabricator. And then you find out it's too big. Yeah. That's a space called YU, Yale Union in Portland, Oregon. I don't think they really wanted to, uh, they really wanted to see it, but they really didn't want to show it. So uh, I also bent all their lamps, so I had to come in and fix all their lamps, but which was kind of fun. Um, so I had to find another site for it. This is from my friend's backyard looking down on it. So I was interested in that idea of, of you know, that you're standing outside and, you know, like standing outside of any building, you know, standing outside of a black building or standing outside of a place you're not sure about and that, that risk involved with entering an architecture. It could be, I mean, it could be, a, it could be an Ikea, it could be an art school, it could be, it could be anything. And that, that payoff of what happens when you go inside and then the idea of, of the people standing outside watching you have more fun than they're having. Um, so I put big, big eyes on it, which were clear. So you can see the people jumping around inside while you're standing outside. Yeah, I love kids. Um, I love the way they interact with objects. There's, there's no real pro protocol as, as long as it involves fun and, um, and kind of the gaining of some knowledge. So, you know, the parents know what's going on. The kid doesn't care. Uh, and then, you know, try to compel the parent to enter as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, as A.A. A. Bronson says, the asshole is the revolution. Uh, this was the show California Split at the Pit. Um, it was based upon Robert Altman's film California Split, which is a film with Elliot Gould and um, George Segal and Sterling Hayden kind of as the alcoholic writer. Uh, in actual gamblers in the film. And I was equating the, the gambling in the film with the act of, of, of an art practice and the, and the idea of making work and when do you walk away from the table and the idea that it really is uh, on some level, you know, uh, compulsive and a game. Uh, this is the pit in Los Angeles. It's an artist run space. It's run by, run by uh, Adam, uh, Adam Miller and Devin Oder who went to CalArts. And this is kind of a walk through the show, so. Right, you know 
where they are. Installation shot. Uh, I think cardboard boxes are uh, kind of the new minimalism. Amazon Prime minimalism at your front door. Uh, that piece is called Life After Mar Marfa. So um, those are sausages I made. So they're called collector's sausage. And there's a collector that asked me to clean out her storage unit. And inside were all these Christie's and Sotheby's catalogs with all the prices written in them and things circled that they wanted to purchase. And they said, please destroy these. And I was like, sure. So I took them home and I shredded them and cooked them up with lard and spices, read all these sausage recipes and um, prog salt. So they're actually stable. And then I threw a bunch of old sex lube and weed I had sitting around my, my house uh, into the mix and made this giant spiral of sausages. It's actually stable. I mean, it is a nod to Dieter Rott's litter worst. I put it in a cardboard box by the front door because I'm really, you know, everyone's had, all my friends are having kids now and I really love, anyone see that picture of the kids crawling inside the Donald Judd in London and the parents just standing there ignoring it on their phones and there was all this outrage about whether children have any decency or respect and I was like, why should they? But I was like that idea of this cardboard box being there and then kids not being able to resist tearing at this cardboard box and their parents looking inside and being like, oh, please leave that alone. Uh, this is a poker table that's too tall to play poker on and precariously perched on the edge of this, this pit, which th that's why it's called the Pit LA. It's a former garage. Um, I grew up with a, a professional poker player in my family. Um, this piece was called On Tilt. On Tilt is when a, when a gambler loses it and can't walk away. Uh, these were 666 poker chips that said give up art. Uh, this is a matchbook, it says California Girls. I, I like the idea. I may have the table, I made the table myself, but I made one of the legs too short. I love it when you go to a restaurant or somewhere and the, legs, the table legs too short and you have to stick to shim it, something under it. So I like this idea of like a, a table precariously perched on the edge, but um, kind of propped up with a Beach Boys song. So these three pieces, um, I wanted to make my own ready-mades. So, uh, I made these and then gold leaf them. I didn't fabricate the steel in the, in the, in the middle one, but the, the one on the left is called uh, the Great Stone Face. Uh, it's a prop that's used in many Buster Keaton films, the, the cup rack or the, or the coat rack or the hat rack, the expanding one, you ever seen, you all seen it? That, that people are always getting hit with or punched with or things are falling down. And then I draped more collector sausages over it. Uh, the middle one is called a uh, trebuchet and I just took it straight from Duchamp. It means trap in French. Uh, and then the one on the right is called a uh, LA modernist home knockoff easy hang by Herman Miller So it don't look too close at it. It's pretty crooked, but uh, Some people came to the opening and said honey. Don't we have one of these at home? Uh, and then I 24 karat gold leaf them this idea of, of making something uh, of little value Have even less value by plating it with gold like making it you know, so gaudy Uh, I'll end with this video. Uh, this is a video I made called I Know, I Know, I Know. 
Uh, it's an action shot over the duration of a day in the studio, lamponing and tongue kissing the head shots from a list of 200 white male artists, critical theorists, writers, directors, actors, punk rock musicians, hippies, political activists, rebels, curators, and art dealers, influential to my development as an artist. Perform while hiding behind the mask of actual talent, as well as an illustration of the Western culture's penchants for expediating the destruction of those, actual ta those who are actually talented once they achieve a mediated culture's construct of success. I believe that successful culture, cultural criticism and true slapstick with pathos or pathos must be directed and begin with oneself. Plus, I get to give the viewer slash audience the raspberry. And then we'll take questions, but this runs nine minutes. clock ticking up here is making me really nervous. Can you, can you hear it?
questions?